Hi, this is Fortune Buchholz of NotFortunesFool.com and I'm here to make another video for you today. And this is about the book that I've been working on uh, for most of the summer. It's a beautiful book about the Herman Handel Tarot. So let me step back for just a moment and apologize for the long delay between my last video on the history of the Lenormand and its images, uh, which I made in February, and I think you all saw that. Uh, and then I went back to working on the Kipper book I had already been working on, and then I got the opportunity to do a last edit on this beautiful book of the Herman Handel Tarot. So uh, this uh, book, you know, has been um, underway for seven years. And it, the work on it was uh, paused briefly due to the artist's untimely death in 2011. But it does uh, include a number of essays by people who knew him, including his widow, Erica Handel, several critical appraisals by people who are, you know, um, who are well known uh, in Germany, including the curator of the Playing Card Museum in Altenburg, Germany. And then, um, of course, it has the beautiful text and meanings of the, of the cards themselves, of the tarot cards themselves, by eminent tarot author Rachel Pollock, who was a close friend of Handel's uh, for many years. So let's go ahead and uh, sort of just take a look at this beautiful coffee table art book. Uh, which I had the great privilege to work on this summer. And it's really uh, a gratifying moment for me to see it released. I know that you will enjoy it, and I do have to say, quite honestly, it is a must-have for every serious tarot collector, everyone who's interested in Herman Handel's art, everyone who's interested in the post-World War II period, and everyone who's interested in fantastical, surrealistic, or even magical realistic art. Uh, because it has so much um, sort of universal spirituality embedded in it, if you are a metaphysical person who has an interest in a wide range of um, spiritual forms, Native American, Hindu, uh, Jewish, uh, Nordic, um, you know, uh, even the I Ching, Taoism, uh, uh, some Buddhism, it's all in this deck. These are all experiences that Herman Handel had in a culturally appropriate manner, not as some kind of cheap spiritual tourist, but out of his own inner need. And I'll talk about that in just a moment. So um, the book comes, you know, shipped in a cardboard box. I've opened it already to spare you the trouble of watching me struggle with, you know, the cardboard and the scissors. Uh, and this is what the book looks like. Let's just get right down to it. You can see it is humongous. It's a big, beautiful coffee table art book of very high quality. It is paperback. It's not a hardback book. It has more than 500 illustrations, not only of Herman Handel's art and paintings, but also pictures of himself through time, his family, uh, the towns that he lived in and things that were important to him. So, um, you know, it's just a fascinating book that tells you so much about, as the title says, his life, his art, and of course, his tarot deck. So, let me go, just go ahead and when you get this book, there is the promotional flyer. This is, in fact, a, an, an opus magnum. This is, in fact, a masterwork. This is an amazing book. You'll love it when you see it. It's so beautiful. And then it comes with this beautiful numbered print of handle. I don't know if you can see that. It's a beautiful, beautiful print of a colored pencil drawing of Handel himself as the fool. So that was a major um, theme in Herman Handel's life. You know, I I am a fool, you know. Ich bin ein Narr. So let's talk about how that came to be. You know, Herman Handel uh, came from an artistic family. Uh, you know, he was born in Berlin, but he spent most of his life in the German state of Hesse around Frankfurt. Uh, as I said, his parents were artistic, and he himself had an artistic streak which he displayed very early as a child. So he was sent to art school, and then he was even apprenticed as a youth into the Frankfurt Theater to become a scene painter, where you know he learned to paint the beautiful and elaborate backdrops for great uh, German plays. Uh, he was most famous, perhaps, for his 
uh, staging and uh, setting of Wagner. Um, and, you know, he did many other plays. He also did experimental works of art, such as sound poetry and uh, many other things. Uh, then he also combined that with, of course, his painting work. So uh, let's talk about how that came to be. You know, Herman Handel had been working as an apprentice painter in the theater and in art school uh, for several years, when at the age of 17, he was drafted forcibly uh, into the Nazi army, and he was sent to the Russian front as cannon fod fodder to basically die. I mean, let's just be very honest about that, you know. Nowadays, we would call such a person a child soldier, right? And this was essentially Herman Handel's um, position, you know. He had grown up inside the, the tragic and horrific Nazi system, and then he was, you know, shipped off to die uh, in the winter in Russia and, you know, that was an obviously a horrible, horrible thing and an abuse of, you know, just a total abuse. It's so horrific we can't, you know, even discuss it. The many horrible and awful things that Herman Handel saw there on the Russian front, uh, you know, uh, genocides in the woods. Uh, he and him, his own uh, unit were, you know, underfed, underclothed. They were starving. They were freezing to death. They were just exposed there, you know, as just no more than, as I said, you know, cannon fodder, human blockades to slow uh, the Russian effort. And finally, when the Russians did overrun his unit and his line, Herman Handel deserted. He fled. He went through the forest and he had many uh, adventures trying to escape the Russian troops and to stay alive because of course if he had been caught he would have been shot on sight. Right, even though he, you know, he's only 17, right? So uh, he has many adventures there. He hides in the woods. Uh, he hides in a farmhouse. He barely escapes cap capture several times, um, both by Russian troops and by, you know, retreating uh, Nazi troops. And then finally, he is in fact caught uh, by the Russians, and he is in fact about to be shot when his life is saved by a Russian Jewish doctor. I mean, so that's obviously a profound and mind-blowing experience for him that, you know, made all the scales fall from his eyes. Uh, he was taken prisoner in a Russian camp where he was for several years, four years, five years. Uh, obviously, the horrors and abuses of uh, the Russian communist prison camps, we don't even have to talk about, all right? Those are well known. Once his art talent became known to the Russians, um, he was forced to stay alive by drawing communist propaganda for them. So think about his situation, right? He had grown up, um, you know, propagandized uh, as, a, as a child by the Nazi regime, you know, and his art and his work in the theater, he had to conform to the horrible, uh, re repulsive Nazi dictates. So he's drawing one kind of propaganda there, and then he's forced to go to the complete opposite side to the Russian communist propaganda, right, which shows him the hollowness of ideology and the horrible things, the terrible abuses that he had seen in himself experience right left him in a profound state of post-traumatic stress disorder and he understood that these kinds of of totalitarian ideologies were not the solution uh, for humanity uh, and had left him deeply scarred so when he's finally returned to uh, Germany, you know, he's struggling with post-traumatic stress disorder and he decides that he will use theater, art, and spirituality to try to heal himself and try to come to terms with the things that he has done, that he has seen, that he's responsible for, and that humanity as a whole continues to be responsible for. Um, his time also gave him a deep appreciation for environmentalism, and he became very uh, active in the German Green Party and did a lot of work on conservation and environmentalism, and you know we should mention that as well. So uh, here's the book. Again, here's the beautiful covers. Let me show you that. Now, let's go straight to uh, the quality of these uh, cards. You know, the cards themselves are influenced by the many different spiritualities that Herman Handel, um, you know, uh, initiated or apprenticed himself to. He's not some cultural tourist, right? He's not slumming 
and appropriating other people's cultures. He actually goes and he lives with the Native Americans. He becomes very close to uh, several people uh, in the Lakota Sioux. He participates in the Sundance fully, right? Um, he also then goes to India, right? He uh, goes even to Israel in a profound moment. Um, and he, you know, he tries to, you know, reconcile himself and all of humanity around him in this, you know, post World War II period, where, where he understands that all of mankind needs profound uh, healing and a form of salvation, a salvation that can't come from outside, but has to come from an inner work and a complete revolution of consciousness. And so he goes to these different spiritual traditions. Um, you know, you even see elements of Buddhism, you see uh, elements of the I Ching, of Taoism in these cards, right? And he presents uh, his life's work all wrapped up in the tarot uh, as a total work of art where he wants to show you the elements that he has used and fused together and melded together in an authentic way to uh, present you with a tool that worked for him to change his consciousness so that you too can use it to do your own healing and to participate in what he felt was the greater change of consciousness that humanity needs in the 20th and 21st century. So um, his painting style, you know, evolved over time, right? So he was obviously, considering the time that he went to art school, was taught a very certain style. And then later he evolved a more expressionistic or even Fauvist style. Here you can see some of his paintings. You can see this is a palette knife painting with heavy impasto and it's focused on bright and contrasting colors. Right? But later on he develops a more fluid technique uh, in oil. He, he becomes obsessed with painting trees Right, obviously because of his experience in the forest. Trees are obviously a very profound symbol for him. When he uh, was able, he bought a house in Tuscany, a house uh, that had many very old olive trees. And so for him, trees talk about the ability to weather anything that comes your way, to draw nourishment from the earth, to suffer many um, indignities, scars, wounds, being struck by lightning, attacked by insects. At, at every moment, you know, struggling to survive, and yet you produce these beautiful fruits, right? The, the beautiful and useful fruit of the olive, the beautiful olive flowers that give such an incredible scent. So um, here you can see, here is, a, for example, a, a painting that goes with the empress, and here you can see how the painting has been dissected, and you can see on one side the German text and also Rachel Pollock's and Eric Handel's comments uh, on the cards, right? So um, you can see throughout the book how the paintings relate to the tarot cards, and you can see there's plenty of details. The colors and the printing quality of this book, the design of this book, is really astonishing. And um, then when it comes to the major arcana, excuse me here, while I flip through, there's a, there's a, a lot of pages, several pages with all of the paintings and uh, the meanings for every uh, card. The minor arcana uh, gets somewhat less uh, treatment, right? There is some discussion, again, of the major paintings that influenced each card. Look at this. This is beautiful. This is for the King of Cups, right? If you like this uh, sort of in his watercolor period where he was mixing oil, uh, oil paint in oil and then using it like watercolor and mixing it with wax. As you can see, he's also using drip techniques, very modernistic techniques, right? <clears throat> um, and then you can see also how when we get into the court cards and the smaller cards, we don't have quite the same detail of the images, but you do have the image and you do have its major symbols and meanings called out here by Rachel, again in both English and German. And then there's a beautiful uh, section towards the back of the book where um, you can see how he chose the backgrounds for all of the suit cards from paintings he had made previously. And he chose paintings he thought uh, emphasized the meaning or the feeling uh, of the suits and then he added the symbols that he thought were appropriate on top of them and this is included again uh, Hebrew letters, runes, 
and in some cases I Ching diagrams. His use of the I Ching is very unique, right? He saw the I Ching uh, not uh, as fitting together so much with the tarot cards, but sometimes as commenting on them, as completing them, as extending them, or as correcting them with balance. So. Um, you can see that he really thought of them. I want to use the Greek word telesma, which means a rite of completion, right? And so his choice of how he put the I Ching to various tarot cards is either an effort to comment on them, to complete them, and to extend them, or if it's a card that he thought, you know, showed some kind of extreme, to balance them, he would add what he thought would be a balancing I Ching work. The runes are the same way. The runes are also very interesting because of his Nazi experience. He worked very hard to um, redeem uh, Nordic culture and uh, these Nordic uh, this, these Nordic ideas from the abuse and um, corruption of uh, the Nazi ideology, and he wanted to sort of bring those back out as something that could be used again in universal consciousness so that you know everyone could benefit from a universal view of all kinds um, of spirituality without taint right without the taint of these you know abusive horrific vile and repulsive totalitarian ideologies be they left or be they right so um, this is just an amazing book in every way. I do recommend, of course, that you you know get a copy of the Handel Tarot if you don't have one. Uh, they're still available. You can often find them used on Amazon or on eBay. Uh, to have the cards with you as you read the book is you know really fantastic. Of course, you can also then get Rachel Pollock's two full-length books where she really delves into the cards in deeper detail than is possible here. But um, this is just, as I said, it's a wonderful book. It's a book that absolutely everyone who is interested in Tarot, in Herman Handel, in this style of art or in the post World War II German period absolutely has to have. It uh, should be available now on the Konigsford Urania site, tarotworld.com, to be ordered. And if it's not there yet, it'll be up there very soon. It may uh, take several weeks to get through to Amazon. I think it's up there now for pre-order. When it will get to UK and US Amazon, I'm not so sure. That I, I think will take several more weeks, so that may be to the end of September or early October. I don't really have a, a time frame on that, and I'm sorry about that. So do just do keep checking in and looking for the book, Handle Life Art Tarot. So again, thank you so much. If you have any questions about the book or any questions about the Handle Tarot, please don't hesitate to ask me on social media. I hope you really enjoyed watching uh, this video. Uh, I hope you got a great sense for uh, the range of information that's in the book from all the various authors as they talk about the experiences of Herman Handel and what he means in different contexts um, of German art, of German theater, uh, of spirituality, of his goal to develop an environmentally based universal consciousness for the 20th and 21st century. Um, you know, all of these things are all wrapped up in this book. Uh, plus, of course, it's just beautiful to look at. So please, don't hesitate to ask me any questions, and I hope to make another video for you soon. Thanks so much, and have a great day.